everybody. I'm Pastor AJ Houseman, and welcome to Shit They Don't Tell You on Sunday, a podcast to dig deeper into aspects of the Bible that get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Well, welcome everybody to episode 18. Um, today, our guest is Pastor Lenny Duncan. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on here. So Lenny is the author of, of a couple of good books um, to check out. Um, his book, Dear Church, a love letter from a black preacher to the widest denomination in the U.S. And then his new book, United States of Grace. Um, Lenny, can you tell us just a, tell us a little bit about um, your, your new book um, and, and, yeah. and why we should check it out? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate the opportunity. Sorry if this sounds that the, uh, the quality is not too good. Uh, AJ was kind enough to allow me to do this episode from the woods. Um, I'm sort of like in this self-imposed exile from the church and academia and book events and everything. Um, let me tell you about this new book, United States of Grace. Yeah. So my first book was like super didactic and was like, read like an epistle you know it just really read like i was um it was very instructive um well, that was and the point. yeah i mean that was the point of the book um but this book this is the book that i originally wanted to write that i pitched broadleaf and they made and, and they kind of pitched this idea for dear church to me mm, okay and um and so that's this is your real writing. baby here this is the thing that I, that, that I, that I wanted to write. And I try not to complain about it. Like I have, like, I have a really charmed kind of publishing career. I've only ever written one publisher and I only ever sent one email to get published. And like, I've only ever like talked to one agent and like, that's just how I am. Like, if I meet you, I like you, like, that's how I'm going to go. And things kind of fell into place. And the book I wanted to pitch was originally called Trajectory of Grace, and it ended up being United States of Grace. Um, so it, it started, really United States of Grace is the story of like the five or six most traumatic things that ever happened to me. But unlike most of these books in the genre, particularly from pastor type or charismatic organizer types or whatever, it's about how they overcame things. And really United States of grace is two things. It's the defense of the Republic from the position of someone who's never had the rights and the privileges of a citizen. And, and what does it mean to still believe in a Republic that rejects you? Right. Mm -hmm. When, um, and what is the Republic? And so it asks that question, like, what is the Republic? Well, the Republic is us. It's the people, right? It's when you lower your disposition to me just enough. And I lower my disposition to you just enough that I noticed the Imagio Day inside you. And I'm like, holy shit. That same thing that's inside me that lights me up and makes me want to go out and do good things, that's inside this other person. And that's amazing. And I really think that's the essence of the Republic. And the second thing is, it's not a story about me. It's a story about all of you. It's about the people who came to my rescue at some of the lowest times in my life. It's about the people who you know, help grace move along in this country. It takes a cast of thousands for someone like me to still be alive. And so the book is a lot of that. Um, but mostly it's really is a defense of like, what does it mean to be born of this country, to be born of this land, to know that its institutions, its leaders, and most of its systems are corrupt, full stop. To know that it's not really... Um, going to last long that this empire is on its last legs and then and then, and then finally and then finally how do you find meaning in all that so what does it mean that 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 on the same you know right now i'm currently in the south and i write about a near lynching that happened to me when i was uh um about 15 mm. um you know less than a couple hundred miles from where i am you know what i mean like real close actually and so what does it mean that I have, I'm having that same moment in the same area or I'm, I'm, I'm having a moment with you where I also had that moment. What does it mean to live and breathe and die and laugh on the land mm. um, and in a country that, 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 you know, that, that doesn't entice loyalty from a lot of us, doesn't entice 
um, uh, patriotism. And so what, what, what is the Republic? Um, yeah. You know, and so that's sort of what the book's about. And, you know, and, and I do that by talking about an America that many of you probably have never experienced, you know, like I was houseless um, from 13 to really, you know, my mid twenties. And now I'm like, kind of like doing the houseless thing in my little camper van by choice. Um, but like, you know, I was able to see all 48 contiguous states by the time I turned 16. I, 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 I got to fall in between the last little bits of the cracks of the subculture that Simon and Garfunkel invite you into when they, when they sing the boxer. Right. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Like, like that world in 1991, 92, 93, 94, and even today is still alive. Um, and so how do we tap into that sense um, um, of, 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 of the sacred story of this land? Because I still think there's sacred stories to tell. So anyway, yeah. I could talk all day about it. <laughs> that's sort of that's what the book's about. Um, and it's my attempt at literature, right? If Dear Church was my first public sentence, um, then, then, uh, United States of Grace is my first public thought. Yeah. Uh, I listen, it sounds enticing to me. So, um, I hope that, um, that everyone can check that out, um, and learn about, um, you know, learn more about your story and how that has shaped you and, and your faith, um, which is a little bit of, of the topic we're going to get into today, right? Like, yeah, um, absolutely. live life experiences and, and how those can um, shape our, our theological vision. Um, so remember that, you know, um, theology is just God talk, you know, um, it's talk about God. Um, well, and, and that we're making it up too, right? That's right yeah, theory, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's why theory so close to the word, to, so close to theology, because it's like, ah, oh, we're making. I mean, we, we think it could be like this. We don't know. Yeah. We don't I, know. I've, I've said that before. So they've definitely heard that where it's like, listen, everything that we're just like, we're trying to grasp at God. And this is just the way that we're doing it. Like we, yep. and everybody's trying to grasp at God a little bit differently. Um, and generally we do that, you know, through our, through our own life experiences. Yeah. hundred percent. And so um, uh, black theology is a form of, of liberation theology. So, so liberation theology um, started in uh, Latin America, specifically in Peru um, in like the 1960s with uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, kind of a, approached this idea of God talk with the understanding based on his life experiences and what he saw the people of Peru going through. Um, that God definitely, you know, has a preferential uh, sides with the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, and the outcast. Um, and that this is the essence of, of what liberation theology is, is that um, God is always siding with, you know, in, in some yeah. parts of the Bible, the lowest, the least of these, those that are thrown away by society, like that's where God is to be found. And that's who God is, is lifting up and, and liberating. Yeah, I would even go one step further and say that if you're looking to experience God, that's the only way you can experience God in, 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 in this current mm -hmm. configuration of this country. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I you know, I, you know, from South America and, and, or, 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 or the global South or, you know, whatever name we've given these these places that aren't their names, you know, but, you know, that's where this is born this idea that that god moves towards human suffering yeah. and that if you want to experience god you got to be in the midst of human suffering and if you want to be in the midst of human suffering you're going to find yourself among a certain class of people typically and when you are amongst those people you realize that like oh wow this whole thing i've been calling the margins or you know or 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 the outside um is actually the center of what god's up to yeah. Well, it also pushes you know? back at like, I think about how luckily we're doing, I think, better at this, at least in parts of, of our church denomination than others is about uh, like the idea of how we would do uh, mission trips, right? That like, right. instead of we have God and we're bringing God into these places where these lowly people, you know, need us, that we're bringing Jesus there, Um but to recognize that, like, no, no, you're not. Um, God is already there and God is already at work um, with those people. Um, and, and that, like, you're not you're not a representative from God, um, you know. 
Right. And I would also say I would also say that like part of of the growth of liberation theology is that, you know, we see black theology, we see black liberation theology. And then we see what I believe is like the 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 evolved version of that, which is womanist theology, you know what I mean, which which, which is, you know, um, you know, and I'm not a womanist, clearly, Um, I, you know, um, my pronouns are he, they. But what I'll say is about that is that womanism, unlike liberation theology, liberation theology will raise you an Amos. It'll raise you a Habakkuk. It'll raise you a, um, it'll, you know, it'll raise you a Moses even. Mm -hmm. But it seems like womanism really has the potential to to birth a a Christ, Mm -hmm. like a a Christ-like figure. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Representing representing the female, you know, the feminine divine. Like I really yeah. believe that woman, and mostly because womanism really approaches theology from the same perspective as a first century, you know, rabbi, which is like, okay, what's how does this affect the community? What's this mean to the people? Yeah. How do the people hear this? You know what I mean? How you know how will my words, actions, deeds, and thoughts <laughs> affect the people? Um, where are the people going? That's probably where God is. It's like really a community first orientation and a heal and a self healing first through community action, you know, at least from what I've experienced. Again, that's not, you know, my realm. I, I would say I fall mostly in liberation theology and it is black liberation theology. Mm-hmm. I would also say that I have a real, like, unlike most black uh, theologians, I'm, uh, I'm a queer theologian. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, uh, you know, unlike most pastors, I probably have uh, um, a much more uh, open view about uh, human sexuality, its place, pleasure. You know, I mean, I, you know, there was a time where, where you know, I, I, I just really believe that pleasure should be a part of like how you enjoy the holy. And so, you know, and, and that's fully in your body. That's fully with your partner or partners. Like, and I'm super into that. And so, yeah. I, you know, but, but. Which, but, which as I say, is, is a whole, a whole nother topic that I honestly would be a great topic um, sometime for the podcast, because there are definitely um, places in the Bible that would support that, um, where we get sort of the idea of, you know, you, you have places where the love that's translated as, you know, love in English is Eros love, um, the erotic yeah. love between Jesus and, and some other people. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, that that's really intimate. Yeah, really. Jesus had many, many intimate relationships. I think many people don't realize that Jesus died for his friends. Yeah. Like, you got a ton of people out here telling you that Jesus died for you and that Jesus died for, for your sin or Jesus died because you jerked off when you were 12 or whatever. <laughs> like, but that's not what happened. You know, that's, that's not the story at all. And if anything, if he did die for anyone, right? Because I don't think Jesus had to die. Um, and we can get into that because um, that was my conclusion at the end of some of my, you know, liberation like exploration is that uh, Christ didn't have to die in the same way that Emma Till didn't have to die. Or Jesus Christ didn't have to die. Yeah, it's, it's it, right. It's humans. It's yeah, human and and that, that and there is a lot more scholars that are catching on to that. Right, that this whole like. Um you know sadistic daddy sort of scapegoat thing or like the pound of flesh that like none of that had to happen for jesus to fulfill the same purpose but that might be also a little deeper than we're digging today but yeah um, yeah yeah yeah. but anyways with like the birth of liberation theology we get we get some other you know liberation theologies um emerged you know people other people from their own life experiences seeing themselves in in god's story um in in a in, in their way, right? So we get black theology, feminist theology, queer theology, um, even oh, native yeah. theology. Um, and then um, as Lenny mentioned, womanist theology, which is um, which is a black feminist um, uh, perspective, particularly from the perspective of, of the lived experiences um, of a woman of color. Um, yeah. and, and then so many more, um, um, just like more people uh, giving, being able to, you know, have a voice and really kind of voice hey, these are also really valid ways to talk about God and to live into the, into the divine. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's part of, I mean, you know, when you approach a liberating Jesus, you know, I mean, because you have two different stories, right? You have a guy who was put to death because you jerked off when you were 12 or like, you know what I mean? You have bad thoughts about your teacher. You thought they were a prick or, 
you know, whatever, he didn't hold the door or whatever. And uh-huh. then, you know, he's put to death by Sky Daddy or whatever. Or you have a guy, you know, who was arrested for sedition after he robbed the Temple Bank in front of thousands of people. And the leaders weren't sure if he was going to start a riot like the guy named Jesus 14 years earlier or what. And just to be safe, they put him to death. That he was yeah. put to death by law enforcement with a conspiracy by religious leaders. They were at it for a while, right? Like this wasn't like it it didn't come out of nowhere. Like you can see that that trend that like every time Jesus went into Jerusalem, there was a a near miss of Mm -hmm. of being arrested for what he was doing. Yeah, being arrested and 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 eventually put to death. And Mm -hmm. and you know, that's why I find it so interesting when I find so many people who are like ready to line up with any political class or um any any agent of the state it's like well you know don't we literally worship a god who who died that way shouldn't we like shouldn't we like be more careful about that well so here's the thing right so like think about now now you're kind of you know pointing out some of the um you know i i think some of the disconnects we have been given in like our societal structure um and the view from this like traditional you know white European male theology that has been, you know, quote unquote tradition um, that like those mentalities that we've been given. I mean, if you actually look into the story um, and actually see it from, from, you know, a different, totally different viewpoint, right? Like it's, Oh, that doesn't actually make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's just interesting to me that, 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 for, you know, for such a well-documented figure, I have, and this includes me, I, I've met very few people who, who actually know what Christ was like. And I, I just have a feeling that his spirit, his energy, and the way he moved was so much more fierce than what anyone, you know, wants to give credit for. Mm-hmm. I mean, and no, and no one even talks about like, a, you know, a 31 year old unmarried rabbi just hanging out with 12 guys, but yeah. whatever. that was super normal at the time, you know, and, 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 but, but, you know, I, at, at the end of the day, I don't think we really know who he is because we haven't suffered like the people of that time. Yeah. Um, you know, the times really kind of make people in a lot of ways. And so like, you know, many of us try and be like Peter, but, you know, you, you, you'd really have to, you, you'd really have to know what it was like to be Peter, right? Because Peter was actually very rich, um, you know, and compared to other people in this town. Um, they recently excavated his house and, you know, it's a rather large house for a fisherman, right? And right. he was a fisherman, but, he, you know, obviously he was profiting from it. But my point is, is that, you know, the times kind of made Peter. You know, that's how Peter was able to, to stay faithful unto death because he had seen enough, you know, mm-hmm. he had experienced enough and his life had been, um, his life had been, you know, altered by some of these things in ways that, that, that I don't think the average American, including me, even knows what it's like. Oh, and you know? can't even like fully comprehend, right? Right. Like, what is it like when like a bunch of shoulders, soldiers come into your house because, your province is short on taxes and they're just going to take everything you earned for the last three months. Like, you know, that was everyday life. That was everyday life in first century Palestine, you know? Hey, listen, there are still some things that feel a little too close to that, um, you know, going on now, but yeah. um, And especially, you know, throughout the last about a hundred years for sure. Yeah. Um, But Lenny, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, we're looking at these different perspectives, um, and, you know, seeing the lens a little differently, um, like what, what is a black theology? What is this perspective? And like, where did it, where did it begin? Yeah. I mean, many people will, will credit uh, uh, folks like Howard Thurman, uh, Jesus and the Disinherited, um, which is a great book. If you get a chance to pick it up, um, James Cone um, mm-hmm. is often credited as the, as the father of this, um, you know, um, there were others, you know, who who had who who were suggesting uh, very liberating points of view. I mean, you look at Dr. King's uh, uh, sermons at the beginning of his ministry in like 63, 64, and then look at him right before his death. And, you know, he he's you know, he's clearly realized that, you know, he starts talking about the triple headed hydra of militarism, capitalism and uh, 
and uh and uh uh forget the uh, i forget the other one but you know what i mean like he starts like going in on capitalism and stuff and he starts to realize that that might be Moloch, that might be babylon um but really james cone was the first one to propose this idea that there could be a theology from the black perspective um and you know he came at it from the place of of the music and the feel and the energy and and what does it mean? And then he proposed the black Jesus, which really screwed people up, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and proposed that perhaps Jesus Christ was, was a breaker of chains and that, yeah. um, he, that he was being used in a way that actually created more change for people. And this was, this was powerful stuff at the time. You know, he was at Union Seminary. Um, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr was still active at the time. So, you know, I mean, he's, he's literally um, not debating, but certainly in a conversation with the father of American progressive Protestantism, you know? Right. Um, and so and part of it has to like, um, like it was the sort of like, because, you know, white Protestants had such like a lukewarm or like a non response to the murder of Dr. King that Cohn was like, no, man, this is this is our, this is the, the greatest sin in America is, is racism. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and look, you know, that grew into his last book before he passed, which is the cross and the lynching tree, which proposes the idea that if you don't understand the history of American lynching, then you don't understand what happened on the cross. And that really what we see. Right. To understand that that is that, that, you know, that this crucifixion would have been there was their form, was their form of, of lynching too. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what it was. It was they they lynched they lynched a they lynched a leader. They lynched an indigenous leader. A a a and and literally it was a it, it was a European, you know, proto European empire that did it. You know, and that's always bad news for people. And I'm like, well, that, people that lynched a guy of color who was making changes. Yeah, and I mean, the empire didn't want. And that's always like bad news to people. I'm like, well, white people show up in the Bible at the end, but you're not going to like where. <laughs> so. so more about then what, you know, kind of what, what are the, the key points that you would say, if you can identify, like, what are, you know, those sort of key core um, theological points? Yeah. I mean, I say for, you know, I, I, I would say everyone who claims to be a, a liberation uh, theologian, and I never claim that people call me that all the time. Um, but I'll say that, I'll say that for me, you know, doing that work around that stuff, um, you know, a key point is, is like, do, is this about the liberation of the other person or is this about anything else? Because if it's not about their liberation, if it's not about their empowerment, if it's not about them getting the ability to take care of themselves, to have autonomy, to change their situation, to, you know, real liberation, um, then it's not real to me. And, and, and to chase that is really hard in the institution. That's why I just left it. Um, and so I say that the first one is, 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 is that, like, it's always care and concern for the other person and their personal liberation. Like, uh, no matter what. And that goes above your theology, that goes above your doctrine, that goes above your rules, that goes above your polity, your ecclesiology, all that stuff. Is if, if any of that stuff is in the way of that person's liberation, of them feeling free, of them experiencing the creator, and living a happy and fulfilled life here and now, mm-hmm. then, it, then it needs to be removed. You know, it, it's, 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 it's in the way of what the creator is trying to do. I would say the second most important thing is to remember that, 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 that God, that, that really we worship a God who steps into human history for the express purpose of salvation. Uh. Some people call that collective liberation or that is experienced as collective liberation by peoples around the world. An example of that is you know the the, the freeing of uh, of 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 um of the Israelites you know from uh, Babylon right you look at that story right it seems like this really personal story to these twelve tribes but that was the fall of the Persian Empire that changed the entire world that was better for everyone right so we seem to have a God that only seems to step into human history to save our collective asses. Uh-huh. 
And so that's really interesting to that that to to know that 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 that's what this God's up to. And if that's what this God's up to, then when I'm when I'm looking into the world, I'm looking for scenes of that, right? I'm looking for evidence of that. And I'm not looking for evidence of that to know that my God is real, but to be closer to my God. And so you end up at scenes of tragedy. You end up, you end up at scenes of challenges. You end up um, um, at these places, but you also end up being a lot closer to who the creator is. Yeah, by seeing the work in the world. Right. Mm-hmm. But that's, you know, especially those are the two things. If, 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 you're, if your theology, your ecclesiology, your personal spirituality gets in the way of liberation of others. I mean, maybe not yourself. Um, I think a little bit of tempering of, of yourself is not a bad thing, mm-hmm. um, but of others. And the second one is, is that we worship a God who only comes in for the express purpose of salvation, which is experienced as collective liberation by the people. Yeah, over. And so, well, so you know, um, like so. a key kind of like, I think missional purpose is um, from, from Luke four, where Jesus says that, you know, God sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners for re- recovery for the side of the blind and oh, yeah. to the oppressed free. Right. Oh um, yeah. That's, that's my, sort of uh, declaring his purpose, right? Like this is what he's doing here. Yeah. That's my centering text actually. Mm. And the inter and the interesting thing is what they do to him right afterwards. They try and throw him off a cliff. Right. <laughs> so, you know, like that, I mean, in that story, right? And, and, and he knew what he was doing when he grabbed the scroll on that day and he read from the book of Isaiah. He knew it was particularly provocative. Yeah. He, knew, say, he knew people were waiting for him to claim some sort of title. So, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, to pretend that, to pretend, I just don't do well when people try and pretend that Jesus Christ was stupid. <laughs> you, Jim, 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 I yeah. Like, 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 like he didn't understand the political, social, or, or well, because people are just really uncomfortable that. anytime Jesus is political, right? Like, and Jesus right. is political a lot, right? So that's a thing we whitewash over, right? Um, is all, all the, the time, time that Jesus gets political, right? And he does that very specifically for very specific reasons at times, right? And he's not doing it in the same sense that we see activists doing it, or people in the Senate or in Congress. When we when we see <coughs> people get uncomfortable where Jesus gets too close to politics, it's mostly because he's dealing with human suffering. Mm-hmm. He's asking a question: Why is this person hungry? Why are these people? You know, why are these widows, which is a you know a catch-all phrase for all unmarried poor women? You know, why are they suffering? Yeah. Why Why is the temple more well appointed than people's homes? Right. And these are so uncomfortable questions, right? To to think about, you know, that there is a reason, there is a systematic reason why right. we have humans have set up our world that, that has this suffering in it. And he's challenging them. Right. And so and so a lot of times that's what he's doing. He's moving towards the suffering, he's offering healing. But what we notice about Jesus, which I think is the most interesting thing, is that he's incredibly merciful to individuals. When you get an individual in a story, Jesus is like, what? You, you blew up a house and murdered five people? That's cool, dude. Yeah. You know, like, like you've turned, like, it's all good. Just turn around and change your life, right? And there's always some very specific things he tells people to do. Right. But, yeah, but to the individual, generally, really merciful. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to systems, institutions, Jesus holds nothing back. He talks about how they'll be cast to the ground, how there won't be a stone left, how they are bereft of, of any real hope, how God has turned God's own back on God's chosen leaders. I mean, you know, when he talks about Rome, the way he talks about Rome, even his name, Son of Man, is a play on the emperor's title, the Son of God. Mm-hmm. So, so here's the Son of God making fun of, according to the writers, the Son of God making fun of someone who calls himself the son of God by calling himself the son of man. But that's not political. (laughs) Right. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, but, but, you know, so institutions, large empires, large things, large organizations, Jesus seemed to fucking hate them with a passion. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but the people you never met one you didn't like. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so when you're looking at, you know, as we're, we're getting, you know, as Lenny's sharing with us, you know, looking at the perspective of, of Jesus, you know, just in a way that really emphasizes like who Jesus was and what his purpose is. Um, but that like, it takes for, for us to kind of, as you know, to kind of get that emerge in our humanity, right? Like it took, finally having someone, you know, the perspective of the people on the margins to give voice to it, right? Because for the longest time, you know, um, and we talked about this when we, we talked about the slave Bible, right? Like this was the religion, you know, brought by the oppressors, um, you know, oh, this, yeah. was, this was um, this was the religion that was brought into indigenous places in the America, you know, by the, by the, by the white people, um, you know, uh, in, yeah. in Europe. And then also with, um, you know, with the slave trade, right? So the slave Bible that they have, they only wanted them to have certain chunks of it. 33 books. We got 33 books and none of them talked about liberation. None of them talked about freedom. None of them talked about setting the captives free. It was all very yeah. specifically picked. I would also go one step further, and I would. I, it's 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 now my fervent belief that Black Americans don't worship the same God as White Americans. Ooh, I, so I. This is my big question because I, I mean, so you're you're hitting on it. Is is this is the religion of the oppressors, right? Like this is the religion of the people that uh, you know um, caused such great suffering, who um, imprisoned and enslaved people. Why? how did how did this this catch on right like why yeah why did it well that, well that's what my phd work is actually studying on i'm oh, studying nice. the yeah so i'm going to graduate theological union starting uh, january 2021 um i'm focusing on uh the connections of conjure ifa uh santeria um kola uh 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 Vudan, Hudu, all of um, those things of the, just went over almost everyone that heard that's him. Yeah. Basically <laughs> Af a African traditional religions that are earth based and they're all, um, and they're all kind of based off of um, this thing called Ifa, which comes out of Yoruba, which is now modern day Nigeria. But I, and here's why I think, I don't think it's a intellectual thing. Like, I don't think that like people are like, I just choose this other guy. Like, I don't think it's like that. I just think it's the way that our cultures and our peoples naturally try and touch the divine, mm. which I think is part of the spice of it and part of the beauty and the variety of it. And I love, um, but I'll say this, um, you know, master wanted Christians. So master got Christians. Mm. He put us in a room. He let us have music and he let us be alone and talk amongst ourselves. Then you get the Denmark Vessies of the world. So then you get the Nat Turner's of the world. Right? And you can see Nat Turner's Bible in the African American History Museum in uh -huh. DC right now. It looks like a lotus. You know what I mean? It's so old and creased and beautiful. And what they realized was, I think early on, particularly the mamas realized that these people didn't even read their own Bible. Uh -huh. And they didn't even understand it. When we read Psalm 69, we saw it as a defensive, you know, you know, or or chant that called in God, you know, other people saw it as a, as an old Psalm, you know? And so when you, you know, and, and, and there's something about this story of this man who was put to death for, for, for the act of trying to love his own people. Yeah. That's so infectious that even if you pull away every mention in the Bible and every mention of liberation and freedom, you're still left with the four Gospels and you can't avoid it, right? And so I think we do. I think there are several different Jesus Christ running around the United States of America right now, empowered by, empowered by people's thought and prayer and energy or whatever. Um, but there just really are because I don't understand. I've, I, I just don't understand who the Jesus is that most people present to me. Not only does it not match the biblical narrative, it doesn't match my life experience. And if that's who he is, then he's a fit. Mm. And, I don't want, and I don't want anything to do with him. I'm sorry. I just don't. Yeah. You know? And, um, 
But instead, so I, you see a Jesus that's like there, there with us, uh, loving, uh, walking shoulder to shoulder with us, um, just as rad and as fun and as sexy and as funny, and um, just all the things you you know. Think of all your best friends and put all that energy into like one solid like ball of light right now. Yeah, I mean. You know what I mean? Like, he, he, he had to be rad to be around. He had to be fun. Yeah. He had to be a lot of things that we don't make him. But at the end of the day, I think um, that for the most part, Americans worship Moloch or some other Babylonian god, some fallen god. Um, and it's interesting, the Jesus that they love the one who turns out black and brown bodies like it's nothing. The mm -hmm. one who the one who was a migrant but doesn't care for migrants. The one who, you know, was born of a unwed pregnant mother but doesn't care about unwed pregnant mothers. The one who spent most of his time not having a home, but yet wants you to have a mansion. The one who spent most of his time feeding others, but yet wants you to not worry about the hungry. The one who suddenly cared, you know, never spent one minute in a romantic relationship as recorded by the Gospels. At least there was some, there's some cares sexiness. cares very much about who you have sex with? Yeah. Right. You know, like mm -hmm. it just, you know, the, the guy who never mentioned homosexuality, but is obsessed with it. I just don't know. And I'm not just talking about the biblical narrative. I'm talking about my experience. You know, I met Jesus Christ in the back of a Grateful Dead show. And he entered a cosmology that was already very full. It was a full room. And, you know, when he walked in, they were like, all right, take a seat over here. We'll get to you, you know? Yeah. And, but I met him in the back of a Grateful Dead show. Like, it was mad accessible. It, and it was weird, and it was strange, and I chased it. And it felt like a spiritual experience. It felt like a vision quest. It felt like something, right? And... That is not who I hear people talking about. What I hear people talking about is some sort of weird sky senator with weird rules, you know, sky like it's just, senator. that's a good one. Yeah. Like, you know, like he's just like, oh, I have a new bill. Um, you can't watch porn. Hub. You know, we got to pass mm -hmm. by the body angels. Like, you know, like this is like weird stuff that I don't think Christ was concerned with at all. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and, yeah. and so, and that's, and I've just become convinced that it's got to be a separate God. It's got to be a different God. It just has to be because it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't sound the same and it doesn't have the same results. But that the, you know, Jesus is the person that again is always, I, I so I've talked about this before and um, we'll, we'll hear about it again with, with pastor Chris and um, with queer theology, but that like, you know, God, you know, this idea that like Jesus came to save the world. Right. But it was the whole world, the cosmos, um, right. that it wasn't individual persons. Right. And so like we, as a humanity, like our salvation is in, lifting up the lowest and the least of these like right right so it's like when we when we give liberation to all of humanity that's where that right. solution is yeah yeah 100 percent. it's a uh, how i always describe it to people like when we first start talking about the subject i look well i don't believe i believe that jesus died because of sin i don't believe that jesus died for your sin and mm -hmm. i was like anyway. and there's a big difference you yeah, know, sin is. Is, you know sin is a real force it's obviously has life of its own um, I call it white supremacy. I mean, you can put lots of names on it, you know, um, but you know, that's what it is. It's, it's radical evil. It's real. Uh, you know, has a life of its own. It's much more supernatural than the progressive church wants to admit. Um, and that's why like you can't explain to your uncle why what they think is wrong. And that's why they don't understand. There's just something happening that's otherworldly with them. Um, and that same force is the same forces that empowered those law enforcement officers and those politicians to put Christ to death. Yeah. Okay. So talk thing. about, well, so talk about what are some, um, like, what are some like current, what are some like current, you know, themes or trends or like how has, cause we talked about the four parents of, of black theology, but like what's going on now? 
Yeah. So now, I mean, you know, one thing I know is that whenever we talk about uh, black theology or blackness, you know, it's not a monolith, not a monolith, but, um, you know, I mean, from my perspective, I'm really leaning more into my Toni Morrison than anything else. Mm. Um, I'm looking for magic. I'm looking for fables. I'm looking for sacred stories. I'm looking for enchanted creatures. I'm looking for cliffs that lean over the edge of a new dawn until tomorrow. I'm looking for spiritual revolution. And that, I think, is alive and well in Black theology. I would say that I've gotten more into African traditional religion. I don't believe that Christianity can be the sole sustenance uh, for uh, any um, person of color in this land anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing is folks going back to, you know, their ancestors, going back to, um, you know, the Orisha, going back to... Um, some of the things that we interacted with and 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 believed in, um, you know, before we came here, and so you know, you, you see a little bit of that leaking into the church. You see a lot more libation ceremonies, which is totally mm -hmm. ifa, totally ifa. I, whatever those pastors tell, they're lying to you. It's totally ifa. Um, you know, they, I mean, they, they make it sound real nice and they call them angels and all those things, but they're talking about, you know, they're talking about the Orisha. Mm. And so, um, and, and, and so, you know, you saw some of that, but, you know, you're starting to see more of that. And, and, and here's the thing, too, is that, you know, you're seeing more of that with white folks, too, because, you know, in the exchange for whiteness, you lost so much. You lost your ability to be Italian, to be German, to be, to be. To, to, to be Scandinavian, uh, you, you had a culture, you had a people. In fact, yeah. you, had a, you had an indigenous spiritual practice. And whether that was St. Bridget or St. Bartholomew or who are, you had a way that you connected to that. And what we lose in the exchange here to be a part of this culture is that we, we accept a, a monoculture that does not help you get into your personal spiritual practice and yeah. what does it mean you know what does it mean to why have people been lighting candles by saints for thousands of years for particular yeah. things on so particular days with particular herbs and particular incense right why have certain people gone out um, during certain times of the moon why have women always learned the natural healing ways of what grows around them so they can heal those about them right and 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 i i would say that liberation theology um, is doing what it's supposed to do um, it's, it's leaving the church <laughs> um and it's and it's really about helping people become everyday people become practitioners you know and so that's a and key, that's the truth. Yeah, and so that's a key component of where definitely where we, um, you know, kind of need to start wrapping our heads around, um, you know, a perspective other than you know this quote unquote traditional one, right? Because it doesn't no. it doesn't align no. it doesn't align with um, you know the work that Christ was doing first of all, and second of all, then what we're called to do. For sure. Well, thanks, Lenny, for, for, for joining us today. Um, I, I appreciate, even from the woods, we even, you know, we'll have some nice sounds of the birds chirping in the background. And um, if any of the listeners know me very well, they know how, um, you know, pro outdoors I am. So I am always for, uh, you know, doing these things outside. So um, thanks so much for joining us. I just have one more question for you. For yes. folks that are looking into, um, you know, maybe curious a little bit more um, about Black theology, the history of, or, or some current things going on, what are some good resources that they could look into? Yeah, I would say the first resource that you, yeah, a, a great resource that you could look into would be, um, I, I always suggested it's uh, Black Body, uh, Stand Your Ground, Black Body, and Struggle for Justice by Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas out of um, Union Seminary. Okay. Um, I, would, I would say that that is like a great perspective about the history of um, what, of, of what Black women are saying, and particularly Black mothers in this country right now. Um, and where the, the phrase Black Lives Matters comes from, mm. actually. And, you know, um, and, and the roots of, 
of, of everything, you know, um, it was a lot of our shock at not only our own communities, total lack of um, response sometimes uh, by the time Trayvon was killed, but uh, also, you know, just the American justice system. So it, it, it's a great book in that sense. I, I would also suggest that, you know, I always suggest Jesus and the disinherited, um, but, you know, you got to get a copy of The Cross and the Lynching Tree. You got to read yeah. James Cone's last book. James it's Cone. it's 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 seminal, and if you're someone who's really struggling with what does this crucifixion moment mean, and why would God be this brutal, I got to tell you that Doctor Cone's reframing of it might save your life. Yeah, it saved mine. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, a great a great place to start for sure. Um, that's at least definitely where where I as a as a white practitioner was directed to first, and I and I agree. Um, yeah, so thanks thanks Lenny for sharing that and um, some sharing some some stories and some journey um, and for joining us today. Um, for some folks out there, I've had some people ask like for podcast merch. Um, I'm gonna look into that. I don't know. Maybe we'll get some stickers or something. If people really want, yeah. yeah so some some people like really want. I one person literally is like, I just want a T-shirt that says "shit they don't tell you on Sunday." So um, yes, we'll we'll work on that. Um, so work on some pub podcast merch. But um, that's it for this week. Look for us next Tuesday on "shit they don't tell you on Sunday." Um, subscribe and follow us on Facebook.com forward slash "shit they don't tell you on Sunday." And you can get the newest episodes wherever you listen to to podcasts. Um, And, you know, share this with family and friends that you think um, could use, you know, a fresh perspective. Um, And take care, everyone.